Though at times it may not seem that way, this sermon is one of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for the religious freedoms that we all enjoy as Americans. It starts in 12th century Europe when a wealthy merchant named Peter Waldo lived in the thriving commercial center of Lyon, France. Well east of the city, the foothills mounted towards southern alpine heights. Waldo was a literate man, able to read scripture. He funded translation of the Bible into the common tongue so that the common people may also enjoy its blessings. Waldo became deeply moved by the story of the rich young ruler and took it to heart, selling all his possessions and giving the proceeds to the poor. He then went about preaching the gospel and attracting followers who evangelized people in many places, practicing a radical way of living modeled in the New Testament. Soon, Waldensian men, as they were now called, were sent out in pairs, living humbly and moving along from village to village, from town to town, much like the disciples whom Jesus commissions in today's gospel. They reached these towns where they preached, but they were not all the only ones who preached. These men were called the Barbas, or the uncles. They debated in public squares, and women too went out among the people, and in the early days they preached until things got too dangerous. Because you see, the Waldensian movement alarmed powerful elements within the medieval Church of Rome. It was not the itinerant lifestyle or the vow of poverty. Those things happened. It was reading the Bible in the common tongue and preaching on a mission not controlled by the institutional church. The men were now treated as heretics. The women were now treated as witches. Papal bulls decreed the excommunication of the Waldensians and authorized their extermination. Agreements were reached between religious and secular authorities to enforce these edicts by the sword. Etchings from that time show scenes of terror and horror and torture and death. It was not only the Duke of Savoy, their local sovereign, who enforced these edicts. Sometimes the most powerful land army in the world, that of France, sent people, men armed, to enforce these edicts. The Waldensians had begun their religious revolution. Would it survive? Would they even survive? So this sermon begins in a people's hope and then witnesses their devastation, but yet I promise you it finds hope again, and yes, it ends in thanksgiving, And a major part of that hope and of that thanksgiving is grounded in the American experience. On July 4th, 1776, during a hot Philadelphia summer, a group of English colonists declared themselves to be independent of the British crown. Children of the Enlightenment, they argued from natural law and reason and history and experience that they have a life, a right of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness, and that they were entitled to political self-determination, none of which could be taken away by a king or a parliament across the Atlantic. The founding declaration of independence that they wrote and the movement toward which they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor, always to be sought but never having yet been fully realized, began. Yes, they had begun their political revolution. Would it survive? Would they survive? Well, thank God, it appears they did. (laughs) Fifteen years later, their successors established a constitutional government grounded in the rule of law, not in hereditary titles. Mind you, the Constitution they wrote is not a document without deep and even tragic flaws. Conflicts simmered underneath, the worst of which would be resolved only by the suffering and death of a bloody civil war whose greatest battle 
concluded fourscore and seven years after those words of the Declaration of Independence were penned. But before that awful time, during those aspirational yet clear-eyed moments, the founders took certain steps to protect what they had toiled from being usurped by leaders like those who over many centuries had joined the church and state into fatal alliances to exterminate weaker people, such as the Waldensians. Unlike Europe, with its national religions, the American founders amended their new constitution even before its final ratification in 1791 and declared that the government would make no laws respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. What are these two movements, one religious, the other political, their origins separated by half a millennium, have to do with today's gospel? Perhaps more than meets the eye, at least if the beholder regards himself as a child of both the Reformation and the Enlightenment, who peers at these events through these two lenses. The central claim of my Waldensian ancestors was to secure religious freedom. And so I am a child of the Reformation and its precursor, the Waldensian movement. A central claim on my enlightenment-based profession as a lawyer, sworn to preserve the United States Constitution, is to preserve that order. Like the Declaration of Independence before it, the Constitution is grounded in the enlightenment principles of invoking reason and experience as aids to the enterprise of governing human affairs. And if we explore today's gospel text through those two complementary lenses, the Reformation eyes of faith and the Enlightenment eyes of reason, lenses that at least I find to be more compatible than contradictory, we may see how Mark speaks to us today. Let us view today's gospel reading as one written in two parts. And the first part is marked by Jesus' return to his hometown of Nazareth in Galilee, where his own people are first amazed and then reject him. The second part is marked by Jesus sending out the 12 in pairs to proclaim the gospel to the close by villages. This movement falls during Mark's Galilean springtime, a stage in Jesus' ministry when he and his friends could speak and move freely about, engage the crowd, and see their works and words be met with either celebration or with skepticism but not in this moment with censorship and threat. Their steps are not now dogged by scribes and Pharisees, even though some have already turned against Jesus for the offense of healing on the Sabbath. Indeed, Mark told us a few chapters ago that the Pharisees, a religious order focused on the strict observance of the law, had made common cause with the Herodians, a political order committed to preserving the dynasty of Herod the Great. And that in doing so, they had turned against Jesus. It was the beginning of an unholy alliance between religion and politics in their more institutional forms, something that we might liken to a courtship between church and state today. Beware it, even in its beginnings. That effort to find common cause against Jesus had not yet reached its lethal form, later embodied in the collaboration between Jewish temple authorities and their political Roman overlords, a deadly alliance of institutional religion and politics that Jesus will encounter after he leaves Galilee and turns his face toward Jerusalem. For now, though, during Mark's Galilean springtime, there is a certain freedom of movement in Jesus' home region and a certain freedom of discussion. And while I would like to say there is a spirit of discourse, some of the home folks skipped that step. <laughs> they went straight to dismissing Jesus based upon who his family was or what his job was. Come up with your excuses, right? But Jesus had performed deeds of power elsewhere. And though he could not perform them here because it seems that the people who knew him over 30 odd years of his life and their amazing faithlessness have for at least a time stripped away his gifts of grace. 
It is not the response that we would want to see in this homecoming, but mark this, at least it is a free one. Jesus did not try to coerce his neighbors, and at least here in Mark's story, they did not try to shut him up. It is, quite simply, an unsuccessful encounter. Is there something to be thankful even in that, perhaps? Maybe the freedom to listen or not, to follow or not, without the fear of authoritarian reprisal? Jesus does not stop with this setback, though. Just a verse later, we again see that freedom being exercised. He is not prohibited by any threat of force or act of imprisonment from sending out the twelve. He soon does so two by two as the Barbas will go forward 11 centuries later in southern Europe. They are to go to places where evil dwells, to confront it, and to offer hope and healing to the sick and respite from the demonic. And they experience tremendous success, the twelve do, quite a cause for thanksgiving. And of course, today's sermon is about thanksgiving for the freedom that we see, however briefly, in the gospel and for the freedom that we now know. What we see here is freedom of movement beyond the watchful eyes of the religious authorities, especially ones married to the power of the sword. Later, Christian groups did wield that power, at least by proxy through the state. In the early decades of the fourth century, Constantine the Great demanded that religious disputes be settled and that common cause be reached within the church which the empire soon sponsored. But like the alliance between the Pharisees and the Herodians, it came at a cost. Church and state were yoked by power and the will of the church could be enforced by the sword of the state for good or for ill. What then happened? Over the centuries, violent grasps to cling to power or to gain it left millions of people dead. The institutional church became at times master and at times servant of the political institutions of the state. In that light, let us see what to make of the centuries that followed the last time we left the Waldensians. In some places, such as the valleys of the Cochin Alps, tucked away in the northwestern corner of what is now Italy, the Waldensians remained. Groups large enough for the community to survive in their alpine surroundings, able to weather persecutorial storms. Some members accepting death as the fate of a pacifist, sometimes fleeing to Switzerland as refugees, sometimes fighting back, and even prevailing long enough for the community to continue. The Waldensians eventually joined the Reformation a movement with larger and more powerful numbers, an alliance which gave them a chance. Their religious revolution continued, though not in its oldest, purest form, the Barbas no longer going out two by two to the neighboring villages. Rather, they formed a more settled community. With the liberalizing religious laws of the mid-19th century, the Waldensians outgrew the meager resources of thin soil over alpine rock. Some Waldensians, with strange names like Garu and Peru and Martinot and Blainot, found their way to the United States, a land of religious freedom. They arrived a hundred years after the Constitution was ratified and formed the town of Valdez, 65 miles east of here. The Waldensians aligned themselves with the Presbyterian Church in the United States, their fellow descendants of the Reformation, to create a community where they could worship in freedom and participate fully in civic life, enjoying the right to public education, to own property, to operate businesses, to vote, and of course to worship as they chose. Those Waldensians who remained in the valleys joined into partnership with the Methodist Church to form the largest Protestant denomination in Italy. The European group had by the 1600s um, excuse me, by, by the 1960s. They were still surviving in the 1600s. But by the 1960s, they had become among the first Christian denominations to ordain women. 
They have been constant in their support of religious freedom, freedom of conscience, and care for refugees. Pope Francis visited the Waldensian Valleys in Italy several years ago. There, in the Alpine community, he apologized deeply for the maltreatment that the, middle church, that the medieval church had inflicted on their ancestors. It was a grace-filled apology graciously accepted by local church leaders. Let me tell you a little bit of something about what I am wearing today. I pulled it on for purposes of this sermon. It is an addition to my vestment that contains on this side something that was hand-stitched by my cousin Connie, who still lives in Valdez. It is the Waldensian seal that says, Lux lucit and tenebrae, the light shines in the darkness. And on this side is the Edelweiss, the, the flower that would come out from the coldest winters and survive against all expectations. There's part of me that wonders if the Waldensians so loved the Edelweiss, not only because it represented survival, but maybe it pointed back to the French with the fleur de lis and said, we have our flowers too. I went with my family a couple years ago this, to the marriage of my lovely sister Michelle and her fine husband Paul, who are here with us today, along with uh, my nieces, and we visited that place. It was a deeply moving experience, and there will be another time for me to tell you more about it, but I want to report that here they are, still keeping the faith. To return to our moment, a core American insight is that religious freedom is essential to the welfare of the people. And I ask you this, when you were counting your blessings, are you blessed to be in a country where the very people who formed the government also restricted that government's power to regulate matters as close to the heart and the soul as our religious commitments? Do you feel that blessing? What are we to make of this monumental achievement, this American achievement of avoiding the ugly marriage of institutional church and state, and even at times of its imperfect fulfillment when one's fear does not respect or even tries to control the other? At core, the center holds. There is no government-approved body of religious observances through which the state can control the church. There is no official religious institution to manipulate the state. Look like, and we should not have the church wield power over the state by coercing its own members, whether directly by demanding fealty to their doctrines or indirectly by threatening to withhold sacraments from public officials. Our political leaders owe duties to all Americans, not just to the ones of their own denominational traditions. After all, we must remember that when the Galilean springtime had ended and when Jesus had resolutely set his gaze and his path toward Jerusalem, the reigning religious and political authorities conspired against and even killed him scattered his followers for a time, and later attacked the fledgling church. So as an American descendant of Waldensian people, on this day, I give thanks for the religious freedoms that we enjoy. Others might freely reject or accept our religious views and priorities, just as happened to Jesus in Nazareth or the 12 on the road. Like Jesus in the 12, we can try and fail and then maybe go on the next step of our journey and try again and this time succeed without fear of authoritarian reprisal. In these sacred free spaces, we can see the wisdom of our religious and political forebears, the wisdom of both faith and reason, so much more compatible than some people would have us believe. And we can feel this blessed freedom granted by God and protected by our core national principles as a people who has not only declared their independence from England, but who had also restrained the power of the state 
in to meddle in matters of religious conscience. Such has been the true way of our imperfect union and also of our imperfect church, striving, ever striving, for becoming our best and truest selves. And for that, I say, thanks be to God and happy Independence Day to each of you.